So, when I was 16 years old, um, in all honesty, my, uh, my family life was, was falling apart. Um, my parents were on uh, the path towards divorce, and they would d- divorce uh, my second year in college. And um, life at home was really rough. My older brother was away at college, and I was uh, an only child, it felt like, uh, in my home. Um, I've shared before my dad's struggle with drinking, and it was at that time that it took on a different level, a deeper, uh, more uh, painful level to watch. Uh, at that time, too, I uh, kind of had my first girlfriend that, that I thought was going to be with me forever and uh, stay with me, through, especially through these difficult times, and uh, she dumped me, and, um, and all of those things happened in, a, in kind of a simultaneous season, and it was at that time in the spring of my junior year of high school that I found myself asking the question, what's the point of all of this? I mean, really, I, I was kind of told if you, if you do well in school and you, uh, you know, you're a good kid and you follow the rules that life is supposed to kind of hand you um, good things. And yet it was not. It's not handing me good things. And so I remember one particular night I was very much despairing of life itself. I thought to myself, what is the point of all this? And on that particular night, I remember that somebody had handed me this Bible outside my school in in seventh grade. And as I shared with the kids, I began to read. Um, And if you've ever opened up a Gideon's Bible in the hospital or in a hotel room, you, you know the table of contents is what I described, that it says it's where to find help and teachings about some of life's problems. And you all need to understand, I'd never opened a Bible before, um, never gone to church before. And so this was my first introduction to who God was. And I'll tell you that I was, was curious at first, because when you look up things like despair or depressed, it takes you to the Psalms. And for me, I didn't know what a Psalm was. I didn't know who the guy David was that was writing it, and it was interesting because these were words that sounded like what I was going through. It sounded like a man that was in pain, and he was crying out to God, and that caught my attention because my impression of the Bible was that it was just a bunch of rules, um, and yeah, I, I did was given a King James Version, and I was trying to get around the these and the nows and all that stuff, but But it sounded to me like this was a real person crying out to to God in a very real time of of pain and hardship. And this was my first introduction to who God was. And I began to read and read and read. I began looking up things about problems that I didn't have because I just was curious about, about what the Bible had to say about them. Um, and this became, and still is, that thing that, that rooted my knowledge of who God was. And I found that it does talk It does talk about what do we do when we are pulled and blown by forces of of, uh, our own desires. Um, What do we do when we find ourselves tempted by things that we know are not right? This series that we're doing called Follow Me, we're looking at what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in today's day and age. And the first several weeks, we looked at what does it mean to worship? Why do we gather like this and sing songs? And what are we saying and what are we doing when we do that? And in essence, what we're saying is that we're not God. We, we need God. We bow down in worship because he has made us so amazingly, and he cares for us, and he loves us. In the second part of that series, we talked about our need for one another, 
that we cannot do this alone. Life is so hard. We cannot be a follower of Jesus on an island. We need each other. We need a family. We need brothers and sisters around us to to challenge us, to comfort us, and to walk with us. And last week, David Pack uh, introduced us in just a beautiful way about the centrality and the, the, the focus of the Word of God and why we can trust this book and, and how it can be an anchor for our lives. And today we're going to talk about temptation. And, and if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to Matthew chapter 4. If you need a Bible, ushers would love to hand you one. Just raise your hand and they'll get you one. And... Before I read this passage from Matthew 4, um, I'm going to kind of explain the context of it in the same way that when I first read through the gospel of Matthew, I I had a hard time understanding. It was kind of like a story was being told about a man that I didn't know. And in in the gospel of Matthew begins with with a list of of names that were completely unfamiliar to me, Uh, a birth story that I was like, oh, that's Christmas, I get that. And then he gets baptized, somebody pours water over his head, John the Baptist, who seems like a strange character, and, and then this happens. Um, so I want you to kind of, even if you've heard this story before, think for a moment about the, uh, how you would be introduced to Jesus, um, and this was one of the first things that happened to him. Matthew chapter 4, it says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. I invite you to follow along in the, in the yellow outline if you're a fill-in-the-blank kind of person. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is really some, a couple of things that, that in studying this passage it revealed about the evil one. Um, and then the three temptations itself, the three answers that Jesus gives, and then what we can do. So first, one of the things that I found was interesting was that, that there are words used in the Greek language to describe Satan. And, and he's a, a slanderer. He's an accuser. And, and I made a little mistake on your outline. The actual literal meaning of his name, Satan, is the adversary. He's our enemy. And think for a moment, the, the, now if nobody else has this, I'm going to be really embarrassed, but I'm betting everybody does. So that voice that you have inside your head that accuses you, that says you're no good, that, that kind of says things like, well, if you're really a follower of Jesus, then X, Y, and Z. Um, we can trust that that's most likely the evil one because that's, that's what he sounds like. He's like, uh, no offense to attorneys here in the room, he's like an attorney. He's like an attorney that is, is prosecuting you in front of a holy God. He's accusing you. And the good news of the gospel is, by the way, that we have been reconciled to him. Our punishment has been paid for. So one of the other things that I found was interesting, that if you, if you dive into this Greek language a little bit, that, that it says that the one who was pressuring him, the one who was pressuring him 
is, is, what, is how the Greek language describes um, uh, Satan. And, it, and I began to reflect on that, that that, that is also that feeling that I have when I feel like I'm being tempted, that it's, it's kind of a rushing feeling. Like, you better move, move, you better do that, you better do that. And, and I don't know about you, I think that God sometimes speaks with urgency, but it doesn't sound like that. It is that, that, that pressure, that testing, that, that, that pushing, that's what Satan does. And that's what Satan did to Jesus. Let's look at these three temptations for a moment. The first temptation is, is obviously a physical one. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know how many of you have ever been without food for a day or fasted for a day or more. What are you after not eating one meal? Simple answer. This is like children's sermon. What are you after you haven't eaten for a while? Hungry. Yes, you're hungry. And, and so Satan comes with the first temptation and he addresses this physical need. Jesus was a human being. And so, yes, he felt hunger. As David shared before his prayer, he was tempted in every, every way because he was a human being like us. And so Satan went at that first physical need that Jesus was feeling. And I'll get to what Jesus answers in a moment. The second one is that, that Satan tempts Jesus and at his need to prove himself. If you notice, most of the temptations say, if you are the son of God, and he's trying to get at any, any slice that, that Jesus might doubt who God is and, and whether he'll come through for him. And so he describes this temptation of he takes him up to the holy city, Jerusalem, takes him to the highest point of the, the, the temple, and he says, throw yourself down from here. Now, we have to understand that, that at most times of the day in the temple, that there would be hundreds, if not thousands of people in and around the temple. So throwing yourself down isn't just about your physical safety. That is God going to come through for you and keep you from injury? It's also about making a show. Because can you imagine for a moment being at the foot of the temple and seeing two figures at the top of it and all of a sudden, one of them falling down, and then a legion of angels coming and lifting one of them up. All of a sudden, everybody's attention is on. And, and, and so Satan is saying, Jesus, look, everybody will know who you are if that happens. And so he's tempting to say, prove yourself. And as I was thinking about this, Satan doesn't have the market on that temptation. Think for a moment of how Jesus... But when the, the religious leaders of his day came to him, they said, okay, well, if you're really this, then do this sign. Do this miracle. Show us. Show us. So in essence, this was practice for what Jesus would deal with for the next three years of his ministry. So the third temptation, it's our need for power. And I think all of us, whether we like it or not, none of us would say, yeah, I have a need for power. But we like the idea of having authority and influence to be known. And Satan says, takes him and shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and he says, I'll give you all of this if you'll just bow down and worship me. Sounds like a simple thing. Sounds like a simple thing, but Jesus will not bow down to anyone but his Father. Let's look at his answers. Um, Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy for every single time that he is tempted. He doesn't come up with anything new, though he could have. <laughs> He's the son of God. He quoted from the Bible. He quoted from the book of Deuteronomy, which was one of the books that was after the exodus, the, the, the foundational event for God's people where they were set free from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Deuteronomy, in essence is kind of answering the question, okay, if we've been set free and we're God's people, how are we supposed to live? If, if you, you know, ever go to a Christian bookstore and, and the, that, uh, that, that verse that talks about writing 
the commands on the doorposts and on the frames of your houses. Talk about them when you get up and when you lie down and all that. That's from the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy commands God's people, don't forget. Don't forget who God is and what he's done for you. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that Jesus is saying, don't, you know, he's quoting from the book that says, don't forget. This is how we're supposed to live. His first answer is that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And in the context of Deuteronomy, it's talking about remember, remember when you were hungry? He's talking about God's people when they were being set free from Egypt and they were without food and God provided bread from heaven from them. It was called manna. And they ate from that. They were provided for. Jesus is quoting from that. He's remembering, if this is true for God's people, I know it will be true for me. That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That that Jesus here and elsewhere in the gospel seems to point to a reality that might be foreign to most of us in this room. That there is actually, God's kingdom has a power and resources to it that all of us can draw from if we would ask. And Jesus seems to say that it will feed us much in the way that food feeds us. Do you remember the story about when when Jesus is meeting, there's a woman at the well in John chapter 4, and his disciples have gone away to go get food, and they, they come back, and they ask Jesus if he has already eaten paraphrasing the story a little bit, but he says, my food is to do the work that my father has given me to do, to do the work and the will of my father. There again, Jesus is pointing to the reality that somehow he has been able to learn how to draw upon God and his kingdom and his power, and so that even food does not, is not the only thing that sustains him. But the very word of God feeds in that time of temptation. The second temptation, prove oneself, Um, Jesus quotes from, again, Deuteronomy, but chapter 6. And here, he says, do not put the Lord to the test. The context of it is, is when God's people were thirsty and that they were quarreling with Moses and with God, saying, what have you done? Have you brought us out into this desert to kill us? We don't have any water. And if you remember the story, Moses strikes rock with his staff and water flows from the rock and they are, their, their, uh, their, their thirst is quenched. But it's in that time that that verse, that verse is written, do not put the Lord to the test. Do not test God to see if he is good. Can you... Can you imagine for a moment, I was trying to think about this and, and how that might look in a, in a human relationship. Like, how do you think I would react if, I've got a couple of my kids right here, but if they were to come to me and say, if you're really my dad, then you're going to get me this and this and this. How many of you parents in the room would go, okay, let's, yeah, let's do that. Now, in a, it's just an analogy, but how many times do you think that God has patiently put up with his people going, if you're really God, then you give us this stuff. And that's what, what, what this verse comes out of. Don't put the Lord to the test like that. He's God. He just rescued you. God's not to be played with. He doesn't cater to our every whim and desire to, as if he needs to prove himself to you because he's God. The third answer that Jesus gives is that he's going to worship God only. He's not, gonna, he's not going to, to yield to a temptation to be powerful and relevant and have influence for the sake of worship. He knows that if he were to ever bow the knee to the evil one, that everything would be lost. He knows God enough to say, I will never bow to anyone else than the one that I know has made me, loves me, 
has rescued me and is redeeming the world through me, Jesus. So what do we do? What can we do in times of temptation? Can we learn anything from this? Well, there's one that's obvious. If Jesus drew upon the word of God in those times of temptation, how much more could we? How much more could we draw upon that? And in your your bulletin there, I think it's important that, first of all, we recognize where we are in our in our in our body, our mind, our soul. And and if the very first temptation attacked kind of Jesus' physicality, physical things affect us. And early on in my walk as a Christian, I was taught this little thing that we should never make decisions. We should, we should be wary of the way we speak when we are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. I don't know how many of you have, have heard that same acronym, HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. You should stop. Should should wait to see if maybe if one of those things is causing that because it's a great temptation and how many of us have had to ask for forgiveness when we've come from out of one of those places and we've said something or done something because it came from that. And then once we eat the cheeseburger, we're like, why did I say that? So, um, you should recognize where we are with those things. And then also, um, I put in the bulletin that we should make the call. And what I mean is that can we trust that if we were to call out to Jesus in a moment of temptation, that he would answer? Could we trust that if we were to simply whisper, Lord, help me, Jesus, come to me, that that, that simple call would help us resist temptation. And then, of course, call upon God's word. Is there something that you know, something that you've read, something that is brought to your mind in that moment that, um, that, that speaks to that temptation and helps you withstand it? Is there something that will help with that? You know, one of the, the, the best requirements that I had when I had a class in seminary on pastoral care was that I memorized 100 verses of scripture. The professor said, memorize 100 verses of scripture. Now, I'm not up here to say I could rattle those 100 off right now to you, and I'm not very good at memorizing still as a discipline. But I will tell you that the point that, that the, um, our professor was making was that when you are sitting with someone who is pouring out their pain in front of you, when you're sitting at the bedside of someone that's dying, when you're, someone, when you're sitting with someone that's in a crisis and they want guidance, your shallow words of, it'll be okay one day, don't mean much. But when all of a sudden what is brought to mind is God loves you, with an everlasting love, they know that that word comes from somewhere. It's not just something that you came up with. So when we become students of God's word and we, we believe that they actually are the words of life, then we, in our own lives, the ability to, to withstand temptation with God's help, and the, the ability to encourage our brothers and sisters is just increased 10, 20, 40 fold. So, um, and lastly, um, we need to call upon each other. This goes back to when we were talking about community, that, that the best way that, that we can, can be a family of God is that if we trust one another well enough that when we are in a time of temptation, that, that we could call upon brothers and sisters and say, I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray with me. I need you to remind me that God is good. I need you to remind me of that season in my life when, when I talked about these things and I knew God because right now I'm not in that place. And I want to specifically talk to a, a certain group here. Um, those that are in junior high, high school, college, 20-somethings, you all are in the midst 
of the hardest season of your life when it comes to temptation. The rest of you that remember those years should be nodding your head. And the rest of you should commit yourselves to speak to those that are in that season and say, I know. I know what you're walking through. I know, and, and, and can I share with you one way that I learned to deal with it? And oh, I wasn't perfect at it by any means. But can I share with you what I learned through that season? Because, you know, it won't be any good for me to say, hey, guys, it'll get better when you get older, you hit your 30s, some of your 30s, someone's like, that's not that much better in the 30s. <laughs> the temptations change, don't they? They change. Still get tempted. So I need to let you know that, that those that are in those ages and you feel like you're, you're constantly dealing with that temptation, yes, every single one of us did as well. And we had to cling to God. We had to cling to his word. We had to cling to, to communities like this. And my prayer as a, as a pastor is that we would be the kind of church where generations would be encouraging the other generations without thinking you're, it's weird to do that. My goodness, we need each other. We need each other to share. I mean, some of you, some of you figured out really early on how to withstand certain temptations, and there are a generation of people within here that are going, how, how did you do that? And, and I'm not speaking about some formula, or it's like I memorized 15 verses, and then I did this, and I did that, but you... You did certain things and you saw God meet you there and God showed up in powerful ways and sometimes it's not a formula about what you do, it's the story that God gave you that helps encourage somebody to, to know that, okay, they have a story. Perhaps that will be part of my story too. So my prayer is that we would be the kind of people that across the generations we would encourage one another and we would know for our younger brothers and sisters how difficult these years, years are right now as when it comes to temptation. God's word, it is written, is living and active. It's living and active. These aren't just words in a, on a page they speak and they empower and they, they challenge, they comfort, they correct. They do all of those things. And so may we be people of this book, not that know it because we like to spout off verses and show how much we know, but because we trust that it will transform us. We trust that we will be changed by it because it shows us who God is and what he wants for us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, my prayer is that you would take those words and you would filter out all the things that are like husks of corn and just simply need to be blown away but that the things that provide life and help us to be rooted, that you would plant those deeply. Plant those deeply in our hearts. May we be people that are eager and hungry to know your word. Not because we're going to get a gold star or a jewel and a crown or any of that garbage, but that we would be transformed by it and that we would be brothers and sisters that could encourage one another because of it. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.